Um, interestingly, you know, when we think like we've all experienced grief, we all really, when we think about our experience in the aftermath of a loss, we realize that it's complicated. A lot of times we don't realize that like the American culture is not very good at mourning, at kind of acknowledging death and including it in life. And so a lot of times when we think about grief, we get this sort of picture from the movies of a woman crying, but her eyes and nose don't get red and her makeup doesn't run. She's just beautifully sad. And actually it's much more complicated than that. And there's, um, there's been quite a lot of research about that. I'm gonna try sharing my screen because I think this is a graphic that, um, share. This graphic really sort of um, illustrates a lot of the things that we go through when we experience a loss. And there was a woman named Elizabeth Kubler-Ross who came up with this model originally. And so you can see the descriptors on this page. There's shock. Now, I actually lost my husband very suddenly a couple of years ago. And I still remember, you know, he dropped dead of a heart attack and yet we called the EMTs and they were working. And I remember just sitting in the next room and it was surreal. Like I couldn't think, I couldn't, it, it was just as though time was suspended. And, um, and so you've got shock, you've got denial, like this can't really be true. This, this person can't be gone or this situation can't be gone. You've got <laughs> anger. I like the little parentheses at any target, right? Sometimes you're angry at yourself. Sometimes you're angry at the person. Sometimes you could even be angry at God. Then you're sort of, see, you, bargaining is kind of like, well, maybe if I, maybe if I did this, things would change and things would go back to being the way they were. Depression, which can include hopelessness um, and, you know, despair, anguish. And as you can see, um, they say this is optimal if you can move through these, um, these phases sequentially. But in fact, in my experience, that's not how it works. <laughs> you go back and forth, you sort of ping pong. It's, it's even more tangled up than what we see there in the diagram. But eventually you find a way forward and, um, and you move on. And that's very typical of the grief process. So I, I want to take a minute to just talk about some of the uses of the word, the words lupe and lupeo, which are the Greek words that are translated grief, grieve, sorrow, sorrowful, that kind of thing. We're not going to actually go to the references because I really want to give Jerry a lot of time to get into the details of the exciting part of this. But here are some of the uses of, um, of Lupe and Lupeo. Uh, remember the young ruler who came to Jesus and said, what do I need to do to inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus said, well, do this, this, this. And he said, I've done them all. And then Jesus said, oh, okay, well, just sell everything you have and come and follow me. And the young ruler, <laughs> yeah, simple, right? And the young ruler went away grieved, grieved. Same word as that you sorrow not as others who have no hope. One translation I read said he went away feeling sorry for himself. <laughs> and that's part of grieving too, like, I, I remember after my husband died thinking, 
I didn't sign up for this. This isn't fair. Um, in John, at the end of John, John 21, where Peter and the guys go fishing and Jesus comes back and helps them get this big haul of fish and Peter's busy counting them. And Jesus is saying, do you love me? Do you love me? And he asked them three times and it says Peter was grieved that Jesus asked him a third time whether he loved him. You know, that's not, ooh, 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 I'm so sad. Like, I can imagine he was kind of like, why are you even asking me this? This is, you know, of course I love you. You know I love you. That was his response. And then earlier in John, in John 16, Jesus is talking and he's, he's talking about the fact that he's going to go away and that the disciples are going to be really sad, but that they're going to feel better. And he says, a woman in labor has sorrow, lupe. But when the baby comes, she forgets the anguish for joy that's a, that a child is born. So that word sorrow is kind of tied in, in that reference, to the idea of anguish, which is how you feel when you've, lost, when you've suffered a major loss. Um, in Hebrews 12, where it talks about no discipline in the moment seems joyous, it seems grievous. That's the same word. It's uncomfortable. It's painful. It doesn't feel good. Um, so you can kind of see from these usage uses that all the different shades of what we've all experienced in loss are included in that word. And those are the kinds of things that the believers in Thessalonica were dealing with. And Paul, Paul's inspiration in terms of helping them deal with this broad range of thoughts and emotions was to describe the hope. Because um, it's possible, First, Second Corinthians 7 says, it's possible there's a worldly grief, there's a worldly sorrow, lupe, that leads to death. But there's a godly sorrow that actually can bring you closer to God. And the context, of course, in 2 Corinthians 7 is in terms of sin and repentance. They felt grieved because they recognized that they had sinned and it it caused them to repent. But I think that concept can be broadened to all the contexts of grief. I've seen people who were devastated by grief and never really recovered. It was like a part of them died. And they, they for the rest of their lives, they, they lived in despair and, and pain. But I heard a a great teacher once say, God can, can reveal himself to you when you pass through the valley of the shadow of death in ways that he can't at any other time. And that's certainly been my experience, that it's possible for grief to bring you closer to God. And I think Paul's introduction of the hope in this context was to lead the young believers uh, into a kind of grief that would actually bring them closer to God. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Jerry. Thanks, Alan. Um, you know, this is a, uh, a well-known section to a lot of people. Um, but sometimes when you slow down and, and read a familiar section, you begin to see things that you didn't previously. Or uh, if you're going through a different season in life, you know, sometimes experiences often will 
uh, be present in our mind as we're reading scripture and different things will sort of connect with us at different times in our lives. And so Paul here is addressing the, the Thessalonians in a time when they are suffering and they are coming up with uh, these questions about what about the people who died? You know, and so this is this is sort of his his response to them. And I want to share my screen here to uh, go through a couple a uh, couple items to show you guys on what Paul is trying to communicate. Now, the uh, this section starts off differently than a lot of other sections in the letter. You know, he starts off here by saying, "We don't want you to be ignorant." Now, several other times in the letter, he recalls what he has told them, like when he was with them, or you know, brothers and sisters, he, he's basically just bringing to their remembrance things that he has spoken to them. But this type of a expression is usually reserved by Paul for explaining things not formally known. And so he's saying, uh, I have things I want to tell you because I don't want you guys to be in the dark about these things because these are the things that will deliver you from your worries and your fears and will help you understand who you are in Christ and how to grieve. Because the comparison he makes is we have, uh, we do not want you to be ignorant Thessalonians, brothers and sisters in Christ, concerning those who are asleep. This is just simply a, uh, a euphemistic expression for those who have died. Uh, a euphemism is just a, a softened uh, way or a metaphorical way to express a harsh truth. Uh, these things are very common in scripture, uh, dealing with uh, death, uh, violence, uh, sexuality, and, and other things. And we use them a lot in our culture uh, too. You know, when, when we don't want to be uh, super direct about something, We'll, we'll use sort of a figurative expression to convey what we're talking about. So there's, uh, there's those who are asleep, the dead believers, believers who have passed away, that's another euphemism, or believers who are no longer with us, another euphemistic way to talk about death. The reason here, remember I say we need to really pay attention to this, this conjunction so that it shows the purpose. Why does he want them to be informed? He wants them to be informed so that they do not grieve. Not that they do not grieve completely at all. Like, don't have any sorrow. He's, he compares it then. Don't, we don't want you to grieve like the rest of humankind. So his comparison is, is that there is a way that the rest of the world grieves. And his communication to them He's geared toward setting them apart from the way that the rest of the world experiences loss and pain. Now, we can think about, well, what does that consist of? Well, that's exactly what he goes on to say. Why do they grieve in such a way? They grieve in such a way because they lack hope. Now, do they lack hope in an afterlife? Well, not necessarily. There is a lot of different ways that the ancient world uh, conceptualized what happened after you died. And the typical um, Hellenistic or Greek thinking was that you, when you died, your soul, which was immortal, uh, would go on to live in the afterlife where it had to descend uh, and cross the river Styx and then enter into the underworld, which was called Hades or hell. Uh, and so there, it wasn't that they didn't have any hope in anything beyond uh, death. Uh, what this hope deals with is a specific kind of afterlife. <laughs> More specifically, it deals with resurrection. Uh, and we see this in Ephesians. Uh, if you guys remember, there's a, a passage in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, um, where it says that, um, the uh, Ephesian believers or the audience that Paul is writing to, that uh, they uh, at one time were without God and without hope. No God or, you know, lack of belief in Yahweh, the true God, equals 
no hope, meaning no hope of resurrection life. So these are the, these are the two big things. You know, Paul is basically saying, we don't want you to be ignorant about the believers who have died so that you don't experience the pain like the rest of the world does. And that pain is filled with despair. Uh, there's so many uh, ancient writings and tombstones and other epigraphs that depict the, the dreary outlook people had on, on death. That uh, while they did think about an afterlife often, it was not a good one. It was not one filled with sunshine and rainbows and, and, and happy things that you look forward to. It was, it was a, uh, the underworld was, was not the, the best place to be. The best place to be would, would be back with your family in the, in the state of the living. So uh, the idea of uh, what they looked forward to was not optimistic the way that uh, Paul is saying that Christians have something beautiful and wonderful to look forward to. He then transitions to then start explaining, well, what do you, what do I want you to know, Thessalonians, so that you don't have this, this type of, of pain and sorrow that the rest of the world experiences. Well, he starts with saying for, which shows kind of like a, a causal statement, like um, the uh, connection to what he's saying, uh, that this is an explanation of how he wants them to be informed. He wants them to see this sort of a confession that since we believe that Jesus died and was raised, if in fact, which he uses this as a uh, assumed uh, affirmation that you do Thessalonians believe in Jesus, that he died and was raised, that's what our faith is based on. And since you believe that, then we also believe that through Jesus, God will bring from the grave those who have fallen asleep so that they will be with them. Now, there's a lot here that I, I like to talk about. I, I wanna focus primarily on uh, through Jesus that Paul identifies the agency or the means by which the resurrection is gonna happen that because of Jesus, that his death and resurrection are true. So then through that reality and our connection with him, we too will be raised. Now, common translations will translate the rest of this verse, God will bring with him, Jesus, those who have fallen asleep. And, and that's a difficult way to translate the verse because it misconstrues what Paul is trying to say. Paul is not trying to say that God is going to bring with Jesus from heaven those who have died and are with Jesus and are going to bring him down, bring them down with Jesus from heaven. Because as he'll go on to explain, what happens is the dead people rise from the graves and then go up to meet Jesus. So we have this, we have a, a, a problem here if we translate it as bring with him, because it then suggests that they will be returning with Jesus from heaven. Rather, what this means is it's a reference to will bring back to life those who have fallen asleep. We'll bring, and we translated it, bring up from the grave. Uh, kind of a uh, reference to uh, Daniel uh, chapter 12, I believe, that those who sleep in the dust of the earth will, will be raised. So God will bring up from the grave in resurrection those who have fallen asleep or died so that they will be with him. Now this phrase, with him, this phrase uh, occurs uh, at the end in uh, 4.17 uh, and also 5.10. It's, it's kind of like the, the culminating matter of everything that Paul is leading toward. He's going to be explaining how everyone is going to be with Jesus. His final point is whether you are awake or asleep, whether you're living or dead in 5.10, that everybody's going to be with him. And that's the, that's the bottom line. That's the pastoral aspect of Paul here that he's going to be explaining to the Thessalonians is that those who have died, you don't have to grieve like the rest of the world because what's going to happen is in the end, we're all going to be with Jesus. Now, uh, I think that there's one more thing to explain here 
is that this idea of through Jesus and the power of his resurrection, this is something that the uh, Thessalonians uh, would have already understood because uh, previously uh, Paul uh, talks about in, in other places as, as well. So we can, we can assume this was part of the, Christ, the Christian preaching is he talks about Christ being the first fruits, meaning the first born from among the dead in uh, the first fruits in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and the first born from among, among the dead in uh, Colossians chapter one, uh, verse 18. And uh, these two things showing that Jesus is the forerunner or he is the beginning, actually, Paul says in Colossians chapter one, he's the beginning of the new creation, of bringing to life those who have died. And so this, this God, we also believe that through Jesus, God will act. That's a, it's, it's a small phrase, but it is packed with a, a rich truth for the Thessalonians to grab onto. And this is the hope. Paul doesn't use the word hope here, but that's what he's trying to tell them. He's saying that, you know what? You believe in Jesus. You believe Jesus died and God raised him from the dead. There is hope coming for you because you are in Christ. And through Jesus, you too will experience resurrection. Now, how that happens, uh, Paul is going to use the rest of the section here to explain, okay, well, currently believers who have died, uh, they're not here with the living believers. So how are they going to be here with the living believers? And we're going to see that his concern isn't so much on whether or not they will be there, but if the believers who are alive when Christ return, if there is some sort of a disjunction where they will be with the Lord and the believers who have died will not. We know that the Thessalonians understood that there will be a resurrection uh, of all believers, but they were concerned about a matter of whether or not there would be um, the opportunity for deceased believers to enjoy the most wonderful and glorious event of Christ's return. So it's this hope that Paul is building toward, and in verses 15 through 18, after our discussion here, we're going to unpack how that's going to transpire, and kind of a few elements on what Paul says is going to happen when the Lord returns. So, Ellen, I'd like to turn it back to you as you lead us into our small, our second small group discussion time. Thanks, Jerry. Um, what we uh, what we want you to think about now, you've you've. Uh, it's looked like from your responses and sounded like the discussion about, you know, what you experienced as a result of loss was pretty um, real and uh, you, you went there. And I thank you for that because it can be painful sometimes. Now we'd like you to think about, um, can you think of times in your life when hope has carried you through a difficult time? What were you hoping for and how did hope help you? So it may be the very same time that you talked about in your small groups, it might be something different. But can you think of a time in your life when hope has carried you through a difficult time? What were you hoping for and how did hope help you? And you'll have 10 minutes to talk about that with your partner. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed that discussion. Did every, could everybody think of something that had brought them through a difficult time? Good, good. I think really what, whatever you're, it is that you're hoping for, often what it does is it's kind of acts as a light at the end of the tunnel. It's like the, the, the realization that the current state of affairs isn't going to last, that somehow or other yeah. it's going to change. And that's, that's how it helps you get through challenging times. And that was the function that Paul was um, 
don't, don't saying that the hope of the return could play um, in the face of losing loved ones who were believers, just getting clarity about how they were going to be together again and they weren't you know they were going to see these people they'd lost that they really loved as jerry was pointing out that was what was helping them would help them to get through knowing that yeah they would all be together again so without further ado i'm going to turn it back over to jerry and let him take us further in this passage thanks everybody Well, there was one thing that I wanted to share with you guys about the topic of grief from the first section of tonight that I I didn't, I overlooked it in my notes. I, I wanted to bring it to your attention because I think it's really powerful. It, when we think about grieving, uh, the best model or example for us to look at is our Lord and Savior. You know, was he ever sorrowful? Did he ever grieve? And I think one of the best uh, records for that is when his friend died, when his friend Lazarus died. And that's in John chapter 11 here, as I uh, am sharing. And so Jesus comes and uh, he talks to Mary and Martha and he asks to know where they laid Lazarus. And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Verse 35. Jesus burst into tears. You guys might know this as the shortest verse in the Bible, traditionally translated something like Jesus wept. Um, and uh, that, is, that is an expression of deep anguish, deep grief. When you come to the tomb of your friend and you break down and cry, this is Jesus the Christ. Jesus, our Savior, was filled with emotion. Deep grief came over him when he went to see the tomb of his friend. Now, when people saw him do this, they didn't say, ah, what a wimp. Ah, oh, look at this guy. You know, he can't even hold it together. He's crying like a baby. No, what they recognized was what that grief signified. Love. It says, then the Jews who were standing there, they said, look how he was a friend to him. Now, translating the, one of the Greek words for love here as friendship love, uh, other translations will convey the meaning of, look how much he loved him. Look how much Jesus loved Lazarus, that when he lost Lazarus, he cried. It broke him. He was in great sorrow. So, you know, when we see Jesus experiencing these emotions at the loss of somebody, of a dear friend of his, we can take great comfort knowing that grieving is a human thing that God designed for us to experience. We were designed to experience the highs and lows of life. Now, I think we could say that God didn't originally intend for us to experience death, but Given the state of the world today, uh, we, that is what we experience. Every person experiences death, either of people they know or themselves. But once they die, they don't actually have any emotional experience of their own death. You know? But death is a common place in our fallen world right now. And with the way God designed us to experience life through, through uh, passion and emotions, that uh, grieving over a loss is something completely normal. So I just want to share that with you guys because I, I think it's a, something to keep in mind uh, when understanding that grieving is part of this, this current world we're in. But we do have the promise from Revelation chapter 21 that one day we will not be grieving. There will be nothing left to grieve over. There will be no more pain and sorrow and death in the new creation of the heavens and the earth. I'm gonna get us back here to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter four. And I want to continue on here in verse 15. 15 through 18 is where Paul, he unpacks uh, what's gonna happen at the end time. Uh, 
And he answers the question of concern. And I think this is where we find the crux of the, of the whole passage. Uh, in verse 15 here, he says, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord. Hmm, interestingly, that it's interesting that Paul here calls upon the authority of the Lord Jesus for what he's about to say. You know, he usually doesn't do that unless it's a, a matter of, of dire importance or something that was controversial and which people uh, didn't have a clear understanding of. So I think here what he's saying is that this is actually uh, a message that is backed by the authority of the Lord. And I think this is sort of another way of him saying, this is my apostolic communication to you as an apostle for the Lord, one who is fathering you in the faith. This is what, this is what the Lord has given me to tell you. Now, he puts up, and again, two different people. He says, uh, we who are alive, and he includes himself in that group. So the believers who are currently living, uh, he sort of expands that, which he says, though uh, we who are left, you know, uh, he looks at death as a departure, uh, a separation of the, the believers who have died are no longer there. They have left. Now, that doesn't mean they've left and gone to the underworld or left and gone to, to heaven. It means they've left and gone into the grave and, and they're no longer there with them. So he's saying the ones who are alive are the people who are remaining remaining there uh, together. And uh, the remaining until the coming of the Lord. This phrase, uh, Paul has used uh, a couple times in the letter. And it's interesting that this phrase here coming, he, he doesn't say the return. He says the coming, which uh, in, the, in the scriptures, the return of the Lord and the coming of the Lord are the same thing. Now, the word coming in Greek is actually a technical term. It's uh, parousia. And this technical term, it's technical because it was well known in the Greco-Roman world what a parousia was. It, it wasn't just a, you know, we're coming tonight to have dinner. The parousia was the arrival of someone of importance of high status. It was the term used when a dignitary, like a prince, the C uh, Caesar or emperor himself, or other high-ranking government officials, when they were coming to a city, their arrival was called a parousia. So what, they're, what Paul's saying here is that the people, the believers who are left alive at the parousia, at the arrival, when the Lord returns, he says, they will certainly not precede, certainly not precede. The construction of the Greek here is the most strong and emphatic construction possible. And I think this is what Paul is actually trying to address. You know, it, uh, and that's why I pointed out before that it wasn't about whether or not the uh, dead believers were actually going to be raised from the dead. That's not really the concern that Paul's addressing here. He's making a, a very stark uh, statement about the order of which the end times when the Lord returns is going to transpire. The people who are alive will certainly not, will absolutely not precede those who have fallen asleep. Precede what? precede them in being with the Lord. So he's trying to show that there's the people who are left and there's the people who are asleep. And if he's trying to uh, straighten out a misconception about, well, maybe the people who are alive when the Lord returns get to be with him first. And then maybe later on, the other believers are raised from the dead and then they get to be with the Lord. And apparently that was a concern that the living believers would have some sort of advantage or the dead believers would be at a disadvantage and wouldn't be able to enjoy the glorious parousia of Jesus. And it is going to be a glorious thing, as he's going to explain here, that there's going to be, there's going to be some fanfare unlike anything else the world has ever seen. Uh, he goes on to talk about four. This is about when the Lord returns, the coming of the Lord. For the Lord himself, 
emphatically pointing to when the Lord returns, he himself will descend from heaven. This harkens back to uh, Acts chapter one, when uh, Jesus ascended into heaven, the angels that were in the clouds as Jesus went into heaven said, you will see him come as he went in the clouds. He will come in the clouds from heaven again. And so he will descend from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of a ruling angel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. Three things here are gonna happen. As Jesus descends from heaven, there's gonna be a loud command and then an archangel or a ruling angel, there will be a voice coming from them, him, her, uh, and then also the sound of the trumpet of God. Now, these three things um, are likely three independent but yet related activities or events that happen as the Lord is descending from heaven. And the loud command, uh, there's a passage in the Gospel of John that talks about the voice of the Lord. And who is supposed to, who this, who the voice of the Lord is directed at. Now, verse 25 in John chapter 5 says, truly, truly, I say to you, the hour comes and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who heard or hear will live. So when Jesus is descending, he is going to shout a loud command. I think this is the voice that is being referred to here, that the loud command is a shout of victory that will initiate the resurrection of the dead believers. The dead believers are the recipients of the voice of the Lord. And in the grave, they will hear the voice of the Lord and they will raise to new life. God will bring them from the grave to be with Jesus. Secondly, the voice of a ruling angel. Now, this is an interesting phrase because we don't have a lot to really go on as to what which, first of all, which archangel or which ruling angel is being referred to um, in the intertestamental period, uh, a lot of Jewish literature identify up to seven different ruling angels, but the Bible really only identifies one, Michael. Michael is the only archangel or ruling angel specifically identified in scripture. Uh, and we're not sure if this is Michael or not. It could be. And uh, we don't know what the voice of him is supposed to be. We don't know if he is going to be also um, shouting along with the Lord Jesus, or if he's going to be saying something different. It's really a, uh, an undefined phrase. Uh, so there's a lot of conjecture about it. And I'd like to just sort of leave it as, as something that's going to happen, but we don't know what it really is. And lastly, there's the sound of the trumpet of God. In the ancient culture and in the Bible, a trumpet is very significant. Uh, trumpet sounds uh, were used for military um, uh, formations and uh, signals. Uh, the trumpet was also used to call people to like the evening sacrifice at the temple. And trumpets were even used in funeral processions to indicate people that there was a group coming who were gonna be mourning in the street and they would be wailing and throwing dust around and things like that. So the whole point is that a trumpet is supposed to be an indicator of something happening. It is to announce the beginning of, of something. And here, the trumpet of God is the announcement of the return of the Lord. When a dignitary was coming to a city, they would have uh, musicians go before them with trumpets, blowing trumpets and announcing the coming of the dignitary or the official to the city. Uh, uh, the last part of this verse, here we go, that the dead in Christ will rise first. Uh, this is what Paul means about the reason why living believers will not precede those who have fallen asleep, because those who have died will be resurrected first. Then, this word then, so we see this goes from here, this happens first, and then we who are alive which you know, Paul is just using as a rhetorical example. It uh, doesn't mean he thought himself to be potentially alive at the Lord's return, 
uh, it just he's just saying that those who of us who are currently living, if we still are alive at the return of the Lord, um, we who are alive, who are left, there's that phrase again, being left, will be suddenly caught up together with them in the clouds for a meeting with the Lord in the air. And so will we always be with the Lord. Uh, the three stages that um, are happening here, I, I have a little graphic depiction of the Lord coming, the resurrection of dead believers, and then you have resurrected and transformed living believers will be gathered together and will then rise to meet the Lord in the clouds in the air. Now, the text says that it's for a meeting with the Lord. Well, this Greek word, apontesis, is another technical word in the Greco-Roman world. Uh, verse 17, then we who are alive, who are left, will be suddenly caught up together with them in the clouds for a meeting. Uh, the phrase is ace apontesis, a meeting, a, uh, this uh, word, apontesis, um, it was just like parousia, and they're actually very closely connected words. Uh, there's a very helpful uh, explanation on the Greco-Roman understanding of this world uh, at the time of Paul. And I'd like to read this to you because it gives a great picture of what an apontesis is. The noun apontesis was a technical term referring to the well-known custom of a Hellenistic or a Greek formal reception. This custom involved the sending of a delegation of leading citizens outside the city to welcome a visiting dignitary and escort that person on the final leg of the journey into their community. Although there was no fixed form to what happened at these formal receptions, they frequently involved the following elements. Once civic leaders become aware that a king or important official was coming to their city, they would adopt a formal resolution to pay tribute to that person by hosting a formal reception in his honor. Prominent citizens, including often priests and priestesses, officers and soldiers, leading teachers and their students, and victorious athletes were then chosen to be part of the delegation that would then meet the visiting dignitary outside the city walls, sometimes a great distance away. Those in the official reception party dressed in their finest clothes, frequently white, and wore laurel wreaths on their heads. Those who remained behind also often wore special clothes and garlands and decorated the city in festive colors. The delegation would meet the coming dignitary with shouts of praise and song, and then escort him the rest of the way into their city, where the citizens would similarly welcome him with incessant shouts and applause. Once inside the city walls, the dignitary would offer sacrifices on the local altars and perhaps pronounce judgment on selected prisoners, liberating some, but sentencing others to execution. This is the, uh, what's behind the word apontesis. This is a, a very frequently used word in the Greco-Roman world. And actually we have the, the exact phrase is used two other times in the scriptures. One, when Paul was on his way to Rome as a prisoner to see Caesar, the brothers and sisters at Rome in the Roman churches, they came out to meet him as far as the form of Apius and the three taverns, which was uh, on the road leading to uh, the Via Apia, the road leading to Rome. And also uh, in the parable of the uh, uh, bridegroom and the, the, uh, vir the virgins and 10 virgins, the bridegroom, when the groom was delayed, they all, the uh, 10 virgins, became drowsy, fell asleep. In the middle of the night, there was a shout, here's the groom, come out to meet him. So the idea of an apontesis uh, is about coming to be together. And when it deals with somebody important, for example, the Lord Jesus, it's basically like a celebration meeting, not just a meeting to say, hi, how are you? It's, this is like, we are gonna celebrate with putting on fancy clothes, wreaths on our heads, dancing around, shouting, singing, 
a celebration of the glorious arrival of the Lord Jesus. The greatest thing that Paul says about this hope is uh, that both this, uh, both the believers who are alive and the believers who will be raised from the dead, it says that they will be caught up together with them. So what it means is that the dead believers will be raised and then the living believers will join them. Then together they will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air together. Equality. Nobody is going to be with the Lord before anybody else. The Lord is going to meet his church all at once. And that is going to be the way that they will always be with the Lord. Never again to be separated from the presence of the one who died for them and who gave them life. And that's why at the end of this great chapter, the concluding statement is, so then. What's to conclude about what I just told you guys, Paul's saying? What's the, what's the reason why this is important? It's because this brings comfort to those who have died, to the, those who are living and have known people who have died. The grieving that Christians grieve is not like other people in the world who have no hope. The hope of the Lord's return brings comfort so that we grieve well. We grieve because we are human and we feel deeply lost in our lives, but we don't, we don't grieve with despair. We grieve with comfort and strength, knowing that one day we will all be with the Lord, whether we are alive or dead, we will be gathered together and suddenly we'll be caught up to be with the Lord. That is the glorious future that, that Paul is painting here for the Thessalonians and to encourage them during their hard affliction uh, in, in their circumstances. So um, I, I think that's uh, where I will leave it for tonight. Um, I just want to give a little uh, plug in for next week that Paul is dealing here specifically with the question of what about believers who have died in chapter five at the beginning, he's going to be like, okay, well, what about the believers who are living right now? So if you want to come back and see the next phase of what Paul is going to explain regarding the return of the Lord, come back next week and we'll talk about the believers who are alive when the Lord returns.